Welcome to the Robert Wenzel Show. Please stand by for Robert Wenzel. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Robert Wenzel Show. I'm Robert Wenzel. My guest today is Butler Schaefer. He teaches at the Southwestern University School of Law. He is an author, and his books include In Restraint of Trade, The Business Campaign Against Competition, 1918-1938, Calculated Chaos, Institutional Threats to Peace and Human Survival, Boundaries of Order, and his latest book is The Wizards of Ozymandias. Ozymandias, uh, Reflection. Right. Ozymandias, yeah, help me out with that, Butler. Tell me about the book. I know it's a collection of essays, but how did you pick such a tongue twister for the title? I ran across Shelley's poem about Ozymandias my first year in college, and I just fell in love with it because it's a very libertarian kind of a message about the tyrant uh, from B.C. era whose statue has been found by some archaeologist. He reads the inscription on it, you know, my name is Osmandius, king of kings, look on my work, she mighty in despair. And then at the end of the poem there, Shelley says, nothing beside remains round the base of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sand stretched far away. You know, so much for the, the hubris of rulers. I just fell in love with that, and I thought that uh, kind of ties in with the Wizard of Oz. Uh, it kind of plays on that same theme. So I just put the two together, the Wizards of Ozymandias. Now, do you see ties with what's going on now in the United States, in the world, with regard to what Shelley wrote about at that time? Or I think that, obviously, in a different kind of a setting, but I think civilization, Western civilization, as we've known it, has come to an end. It used to suggest that it was in the process of collapsing. I think it's pretty well finished. Uh, the question becomes, what do we do after this? And I, I'm very optimistic in terms of the future, but in terms of the present, all those things that we associate with civilized behavior, in terms of the marketplace, economic liberty, uh, respect for individuality, even in the area of politics, the idea of having governments that are supposedly limited in terms of the powers that they can engage in, the value of peace in the world, all of these, you go down the list, of anything that you would think would be essential to a healthy, creative society. And then ask people, if you wanted to negate all of that, if you wanted to have a society which violated all of those conditions, could you think of a better system than what we have right now? And it's not just in the United States. You see it in Europe as well. But you know, this whole system of endless wars, of of a constitution that just really doesn't mean anything. As I tell my students, you know, the constitution is what keeps the government from doing all the terrible things that it does. I suggested to our faculty here a couple of years ago that we ought to just stop teaching constitutional law. It doesn't, it doesn't mean anything. They thought I was joking, but you know, so let's put it in as a subject area in legal history or something of that nature, but restricting and or even directing the power of the state in any way, it doesn't. It's just whatever the president wants to do. If he wants to declare war on someone, he can. He wants to murder somebody, he can. He wants to torture somebody, he can. And very few people are heard uh, complaining about that. I, I thought it was interesting the other day to see that uh, Dennis Kucinich, Democratic congressman from Ohio, had introduced a bill that would make it unlawful for any government employee to murder anyone. You know, that we are at such a place that someone has to consider that as a plausible subject for legislation is, is pathetic. And my guess is it's not going to go anywhere. Wow. Now, one of the essays in your book, in total is 51 essays, and they're all awesome. But one that caught my eye, the, the title is Why TSA Wars, State-Defined Diets, Seat Belts, The War on Drugs, Police Brutality, and Efforts to Control the Internet are all essential to the state. Can you talk a little yeah. bit about that? Well, the state needs conflicts. The state survives only by keeping us divided. This is why you, we, we get divided up into racial groups, ethnic groups, religious groups, um, gender groups, lifestyle groups, whatever it may be, in those kinds of groupings. And then, of course, in international settings as well, you know, one members of one nation versus another and the other people 
terrible people and uh, we need protection from them. So the state is in, has, has always been in the business of creating threats and then organizing people to respond to those threats through the state. In other words, the state will protect us from terrorists. The state will protect us from racial discrimination. The state will protect us from the communists or whoever it is. So the state always needs ongoing threats. And somebody's going to get on an airliner and cause havoc. And so what we need is for someone to stand out there and fondle and grope and everything else passengers before they get on on board the plane. This does two things. Number one, it reinforces the idea that there are all these threats out there in the world. And secondly, it does what was also done in, in Nazi Germany. It degrades human beings and the degradation of the individual is really essential to state rule. People, I think, really need to go back and reread Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning. I mean, he was, Frankl was a prisoner to two of these Nazi concentration camps. And what really hurt the most was not the physical brutality from the guards, but it was the sense of having your sense of personhood destroyed, you know, having all of your hair cut off and having to run around naked. Just the nature of state action. And every time the state comes up with another, now you've got, <laughs> I'm sorry to laugh, but it's just, it, it, it tests your sense of humor at some point to see some of these people who are now thinking in terms of, well, maybe NASA needs to expand its activities in order to protect us from attack by people from some other planet. It's utterly insane. Yeah. Now, in addition to this chapter, a little while down, you have another great chapter that's called The Irrelevance of the State. Can you yeah. talk about that? What we really want, of course, is order in society. Something goes all the way back, at least to Plato's time and his Republic. You know, we had the pyramidal structure. At the top of the pyramid, of course, were the philosopher kings who are going to make all the rules and so forth that would govern the behavior of everyone further down the pyramid. What we discover is, in fact, is complex systems really are not capable of being predicted. You can't predict the outcomes of complex systems over any extended period of time. And as a result, when you want to have order in society, you have to look elsewhere. One of the places that we look, and people who are familiar with economics understand this, you look to the market. The market is a beautiful example of unstructured, spontaneous order operating through the pricing mechanism. You don't need someone in Washington or Sacramento or any other political center to inform us, direct us as to what the price of oatmeal should be or anything like this. You know, if there's a shortage of something, it's going to bid the price up. The people who produce that particular item will increase their production. And you see this in so many settings. The one, one that really encourages me right now are these cities in Europe. There are so many of them now that are just doing away with traffic laws. Well, there's going to be all kinds of chaos and accidents and things of that nature. In truth, it's gone the other way. Uh, traffic accidents have been cut about in half. A lot of the people stated afterwards, you know, the thing that's really nice is you develop more of a sense of rapport with other people. You're not just responding to machines. You're not responding to an electric light and driving on the freeway. If somebody lets you in the, your line of traffic or you let them into your line of traffic, you have this sense of that guy is now your guy. You know, it's like there, there's probably nothing that person could do short of intentionally trying to plow into your car that's going to get you upset with them. You've now developed some kind of a personal relationship, complete stranger. But there's so mm -hmm. much of this. Butler, you mentioned chaos theory, and I have contended that, in a way, Austrian economics, economists, they looked at the methodology of science and realized you, you couldn't calculate everything out, really, in a way, anticipated the math, which is something that's kind of unusual. I think in most cases, when a new theoretical math perspective comes out, then there are applications that scientists realize they can use the math with. But this was a case where the, the Austrian economists, by saying, hey, you can't calculate everything, yeah. came before the math of the chaos theory. Is it? Do you think that way? I think there's validity to that. I think it kind of goes back to Thomas Kuhn's work on the history of scientific revolutions, that when the mm -hmm. existing models no longer work to explain events in the world, you have to look to something else. And before you can do that, there has to be the something else to look to. And I think that one of the things that you find in 
both in chaos theory and elsewhere, is that here's a better explanation for the way the world actually works. One of the other nice things about Austrian economic compared with other economic approaches is that the one thing I've liked about it is that to an Austrian economist, you take into account the kinds of factors that can't be quantified. Mm -hmm. In other words, there is a cost. I got into a discussion one time with someone from the Chicago school, somebody I really respect, I might add, talking about something else, and I raised the point about the Nazi Holocaust. How would you quantify that? How would you quantify the cost of that? And he was troubled by it. He said, yeah, I have to agree. I, it's troublesome, but as an economist, we can't talk about that. And I think as an economist, we have to talk about that. Those are costs. Those are real right, costs. Right. Uh, dehumanizing someone is a real cost. You may not be able to deposit it in a bank account, but it's a cost. Speaking of the Holocaust, one of your essays called The Hitler Test. Yeah. Do you want to talk about that? I had so much fun with that over the years. This is the first day of class when students have never had me or heard of me or anything like that. And I tell them it's time to, we're going to have another election. Here is time to pick a national leader. And there are two candidates for office here. One is candidate A. The other one is candidate B. Candidate A is, let me see if I can find it here. Now. Candidate A is a well-known critic of government, been involved in tax protest movements, has openly advocated secession, armed rebellion against the existing national government, even the overthrow of that government. He's a known member of a militia group that was involved in a shootout with law enforcement authorities. He opposes gun control efforts of the present national government as well as restrictions on open immigration into this country. He's a businessman who's earned his fortune from such businesses as alcohol, tobacco, retailing, and smuggling. Okay, then candidate B is a decorated Army war veteran. He's a Nevada non-smoker and dedicated public health advocate. Uh, his public health interests include fostering a medical research and eliminating cancer. He opposes the use of animals in conducting such research, and on and on. Things of that sort of very politically correct guy. And I ask people to make their selections, and they do it anonymously. I don't know who. And afterwards, I count the ballots, and historically, it's come out to about 75% favoring candidate B, and uh, about 25% on candidate A, and then I tell them afterwards that candidate A is sort of a composite of the founding fathers of this country. And candidate B is Adolf Hitler. And his mouth is drop open. But <laughs> Right. So what do you see in the students that are coming through these days? How aware are they about liberty and how important it is? I find them much more interested in talking about this. You know, 20, 25 years ago, if I'd get into these subjects, which I did, you'd get these blank stares and people looking out the window or wondering... You know, if this isn't on the final exam, where are we talking about it? Things of this nature. <laughs> Today, it's just the opposite. They understand this. This isn't working right. The society that we live in doesn't meet their expectations. It's not run according to the, the expectations they have of it. You know, we're not supposed to be brutalized by cops. We're not supposed to be engaged in wars against the entire world. Our economic system ought to be based upon how good a job you can do anticipating consumer demand and going out and producing something that will satisfy consumer demand. Instead, we have a system based on crony capitalism where the state uses its power to loot the taxpayers to give the money to their friends, things of this sort, things that are no no big secret. And the kids understand this. As Ron Paul said one time, said that the school system may not have done very much of any good, but they at least taught these kids arithmetic. And boy, they they are interested. They they know that something something's got to change. You have an essay in the book called "Anarchy in the Streets." What do you mean by that? It's a takeoff on the old saying that people have: people who dislike any notion that societies can run on their own, and we don't need political systems and structures. I say, oh my goodness, if we had the kind of system you're talking about, we would have anarchy in the streets. By which they mean you know, you're going to have people killing one another and running over right. one another and doing all this sort of stuff. And I pointed out, as I was mentioning uh, a little while ago, uh, the actual behavior out in the streets is very orderly. It really is. And the, the examples that are going on in Europe, and not just in Europe, it's also going on in New Zealand, places like this, 
uh, the James Lott observation about guns, you know, that the more guns, uh, the fewer crimes. And this one is being unsafe is safe. In other words, that when mm-hmm. you recognize a condition as being an unsafe condition, you're more alert, you pay more attention, and so forth. People who respond to, say, a traffic light that's out on a intersection. Karen DeCostier, I think, it was, had a really good video up the other day on this, showing film of the same intersection, one where their street light was out, there was nobody there to, to, to run it, and traffic kept flowing very orderly. The cops show up, and then all of us stop. One thing that I've noticed, I think a lot of police protection overall, even in the streets, is a myth. Because if you travel to a new city and you're at the hotel and, and you ask the concierge, where is it safe, where to go? I mean, that's one of the first things a, uh, a tourist will ask someone at the hotel. Because it's not that the police are protecting the entire city. There are areas that are safe. But those areas tend to be where there's a lot of private activity going on, where there's a bunch of restaurants or at night or shopping area during the day. And it has nothing to do with police, really. Yeah, this is Jane Jacobs' observation about you know, the eyes on the street, so to speak. You have a lot of people there. There's very low crime rate. My oldest daughter lived in Hong Kong for a number of years, and we'd gone over to visit her a few times. It's like rush hour in Manhattan constantly. I mean, 3 o'clock in the morning, the streets are packed. And it said the personal crime of one person against another is almost non-existent. But it's not because enhanced moral character of the people there or anything like that. There are just too many eyes kind of watching too much interaction among people. Just don't do it. Mm -hmm. You have a final essay. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? It came from a talk I gave down at Auburn about nine years ago, I think it was by now, and suggesting that the title of the talk was a cost-benefit analysis of the human spirit. And it went back to the point that I was making earlier about having to include psychics as part of our calculation in terms of what are the costs of doing something. Well, they, they include cost to the human spirit and so forth, as well as costs uh, of a monetary nature. And just suggesting that maybe the Luddites, uh, I'm not a Luddite, I'm not one who mm-hmm. wants to engage in machine-breaking riots or anything like that, but maybe they were onto something. And, I, and the group that I was more attracted in that talk and also in the book, my Irish ancestors, New, and those were the leprechauns. I've always thought of the leprechaun as being kind of a good model for how we ought to live together in society, because the leprechaun was very interested in protecting his gold. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you took his gold, there's going to be hell to pay them trying to get it back. But the one thing the leprechaun will never do in order to protect his gold is to endanger his liberty. In our culture, I think we do kind of just the opposite. As long as the state keeps taking care of us on the monetary level, more entitlements and things of this sort, uh, the more liberty we're prepared to give up. And I've often wondered, even to libertarians, if suppose the state was to say, we will allow you to play around on the Internet, with whatever you want to play around with, provided you give us more control over and supervisory control over what you're doing. I wonder how many of us would say, well, okay, that's, that's a fair trade. I'll go along with that. But leprechaun would not. We ought to go in that direction more. Because I think that what we could learn from, from the leprechaun is not the, the irrelevance of material wealth. Of course it's relevant. It's very important. Even the socialists, you know, say, well, they're so much opposed to all this stuff. The heck they are. The first thing they do when they get into power is to grab it all. So they're not, right. they're not opposed to material wealth. They want it. They want your material wealth and mine. But, we need to figure out ways of protecting that and ways to protect our liberty at the same time. And it kind of requires a mindset that where we are not attached to the material things. They're important to us. We want to protect them, but we aren't so attached to them that we're willing to give up our liberty to protect them. So very, very interesting. Are you following the presidential election uh, race here very closely at all? No. That's entertaining. No, I, I, I've been kind of following uh, Ron Paul's efforts, uh, some de- degree of intelligence uh, out of the whole thing. I am going to be speaking down at the, the Ron Paul rally in Tampa in a couple of weeks. Oh, you know, great. I think he's done such a wonderful, wonderful job. And it, the contrast between Ron and how these other yahoos want to deal with him and, and deal with the issues that are raised is, is amazing. Mm-hmm. And 
for someone who just pays attention, just watches this, they ought to be asking you, what is it that this man is saying that these other people don't want? Mm -hmm. In that sense, I've been following it. In terms of, do I find any attraction for Romney over Obama or vice versa? No, none whatsoever. It's like choosing lung cancer or emphysema. Yeah. Have you been following this attempt to paint uh, Paul Ryan as sort of a Randian? Yeah, and he may, may throw out a phrase from Rand and so forth, but so what? You know. mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I listened to a speech recently where uh, Ryan threw out a uh, trifecta, Rand, mm -hmm. Mises, and the Hayek. Then, of course, you look at what he does and how he votes and votes for the bailouts and TARP and the foreign wars and, you know, just wants to monkey around with health care. You know, it's, it's terrible. Well, the assumption mm. has always been, you know, if you can just throw out the word, uh, and some say, oh, my goodness, that guy is really one of us. No, he's not. Uh, Sarah Palin did some of this. Uh, Michelle Bachman did some of this. You know, just mm -hmm. little phrases here and there that make them sound like, gee, maybe there is some semblance of decency <laughs> within within them. And there isn't. There really isn't. They're just. These people are all part of the political racket. You know, the Republicans and the Democrats are just two wings of the same bird of prey. Yeah. Overall, I get the sense that you're an optimist. Am I correct in that? Or Oh, yeah. You, know, you go back to create uh, Western civilizations with Gutenberg's invention of movable type. Look what followed from that. You know, Everything from the Reformation to the Enlightenment to the Age of Reason to the Scientific Age to the Industrial Revolution and so forth. Well, look what we have now. We have and the, the next stage in the information revolution much more powerful than what emerged from Gutenberg's invention. And there's nothing quite so creative or liberating as the free flow of information. And this is what terrifies the power structure. That's why Hillary wants to control the Internet and everything else, because, my goodness, people find out that they can live according to alternative ways of behaving with one another. They don't need some ruler. They don't need a rule maker, a legislator to sit atop the pyramid. They don't need a philosopher king to design societies. And in that sense, I think it's already developing. This is ongoing. Butler, I believe that book, The Wizard of Ozymandias, which we will include a link to at economicpolicyjournal.com, is doing its part to advance that understanding of liberty the book, which covers all kinds of topics on liberty, is another piece to getting the word out and allowing people around the world to understand what liberty is and what it's about. So I wish you good luck on the book. Thank you. It's dedicated to Sophie and Hans Scholl and the White Rose in Germany in the 1930s, the people who actively opposed the Hitler regime and so forth. These were the kids. These were 20-year-old kids. Okay, very very good. Thank you again, Butler, for being Thank on the you. show. And Thank you for having good luck me. With the I book. enjoyed it. Thank you. Sure, no problem. Bye. That's the end of this show. Thank you very much for listening. Be sure to check back every Sunday morning when a new show is posted at economicpolicyjournal.com. And by the way, make sure you check out economicpolicyjournal.com website every day of the week where I post on the economy, on politics, on liberty, so on and so forth. Every day of the week, all day long, economicpolicyjournal.com. Special shout out to Chris Rossini, who is the executive producer, and also to John Dahlberg, who is head of editing and mastering. I'm Robert Wenzel. Thanks very much for listening.